Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Paralegal Voice here on Legal Talk Network. I'm Vicki Voison, the Paralegal Mentor and host of the Paralegal Voice. I'm a NALA Advanced Certified Paralegal. I publish a newsletter titled Paralegal Strategies, and I'm also the co-author of The Professional Paralegal, A Guide to Finding a Job and Career Success. You'll find more information at paralegalmentor.com. My guest today is Tracy Mose, ACP. Tracy is a certified e-discovery project manager with Brewster and DeAngelis in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she has been since March 2011. She graduated from Oklahoma State University with a BS degree in political science. She's been on the board of directors for the Tulsa Area Paralegal Association since 2007 and is currently serving as president. She's also served as TAPA's NALA liaison and treasurer. She is a paralegal section charter member of the Tulsa County Bar Association and is on the Paralegal Advisory Board for the University of Tulsa. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Vicki. So excited to have you on today. It was about the time I was starting going out to speak for my paralegal mentor business, sort of, and you invited me to Tulsa, and that was just a great event, and I thank you so much for that. Oh, it was wonderful. Yeah, we we enjoyed it. Before we begin, our sponsors should be recognized and thanked. NALA, a professional association for paralegals, providing continuing education and professional certification programs for paralegals at NALA.org. NALA is a force in the promotion and the advancement of the paralegal profession. This podcast is also sponsored by Boston University, Boston University offers an online certificate in paralegal studies. If you're seeking a professional credential or just want to further develop your skills, Boston University provides an affordable, high-quality 14-week program. Visit paralegalonline.bu.edu for this information. That was paralegalonline.b, as in boy, u.edu. Edu. And our next sponsor is ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit servenow.com to learn more. The goal of the Paralegal Voice is to discuss a wide range of topics important to the paralegal industry and share with you leading trends, significant developments, and resources you'll find helpful in your career and your everyday job. Guests are usually included to help explore timely topics, and for that reason, I've invited Tracy Mose, ACP, to be with me today. And our topic is the life of a litigation paralegal. Now, Tracy, your article titled A Litigation Paralegal's Roadmap to Trial, which was published in the May-June issue of NALA's Facts and Findings, was just outstanding. And it included many tips for paralegals involved in litigation and preparing for trial. And I knew that listeners of the Paralegal Voice would be interested in hearing more about the life of a litigation paralegal. But first, I'd like to hear more about your journey to becoming a litigation paralegal. Yeah, I I uh, started uh, when I started my uh, career as a paralegal. I worked for IBM first in the corporate world, and then I went and worked for a immigration lawyer. This was in Los Angeles, and went from immigration into uh, litigation and never went back. I I thrive in the lit- litigation environment. I. I, I like the I like the stress and the high energy that it takes to be a trial paralegal and worked a lot of uh, big cases and high high profile cases since I've been working for Clark Brewster and I just love it. Well, you've made an interesting process because you have worked in the corporate world, 
Yes. And you do prefer to be in a law firm. So I like hearing that, and I like what you've learned along the way. Now, Tracy, did you do any paralegal training besides getting your bachelor's degree? Well, the this is this was back in the early '80s, and the and the um, degree was actually pre-law paralegal. You know, so it was. Uh, I always thought I would go to law school. So it, it was political science uh, predominant, but it, it was called pre-law paralegal back in the day. I didn't take the certification mm-hmm. test until 2007. So, well, tell me about being a uh, certified e-discovery project manager. How did you accomplish that? Yeah, we've been, you know, we've been hearing about e-discovery for years. As a matter of fact, with TAPA, my local association, we've had e-discovery presentations ad, ad nauseum, you know, for years and and it, there was always this threat of e-discovery and and but nobody was doing it. Nobody was actually uh it was just a, a threat. Everybody but nobody was was getting trained or or getting certified, and and then I realized, no, now it's here. And so the lawyers I work for in this firm said, you know, somebody here, somebody in the firm has to get certified. We think it should be you. (laughs) So it was was about a uh, six-month program with the Organization for Legal Professionals is the the certification uh, company I chose, and um, I, I... like I said, it was six months, and I saved all the material down to our online s- server, and so it's available to all the lawyers here. And that just gave me the opportunity to go to the e-discovery meetings with the lawyers and be the voice when it comes to how to search for email and how to um, search for text messages and e- all, all e-discovery. So it's it's been an invaluable certification for me. Right. That sounds really interesting. And you're right about the threat of e-discovery. And, that, and I think we all just hit our heads in the sand and, and hoped that it would go away. But it's not going to. So good for you. Now, I'd like to know, just tell our listeners, what is the life of a litigation paralegal like? At first, it's discovery, discovery, discovery. So I'm. that's what I feel like my specialty is, is the discovery process. So as we get the documents in in discovery, then I keep them organized. And so, for instance, this morning there was a final exhibit list due, and the lawyer I work for said, you know, Tracy, you need to finalize that list. It took me like 10 minutes because I keep everything in a in, organized from the day the document enters the, the firm. So then it's really easy to organize for trial because I've got all my documents all organized and ready to go from day one. Um, and then about a month before trial starts, that's when you have to really start uh, preparing the key documents and getting ready for trial. And I I like to have a month to, to prepare. Sometimes you only have two weeks to prepare, so it depends. But it's it's uh, long hours, and then it's long hours the few weeks before trial, and then, of course, it's long week, long hours during trial. But really, it starts in discovery, and we, we serve discovery with the petition. I work for a plaintiff's firm, so the minute our petition goes out, discovery goes out. So we're, we hit the ground running in this, in this firm. And you always go to trial? Uh, we don't always go to trial, but uh, I've noticed, like last year, uh, we had six trials. This year, I've already had three. So um, I think that uh, in this economy, less the insurance companies would prefer to roll the dice and go to trial than to settle. So we don't settle as many as we used to. And uh, I know other paralegal friends of mine in town have said the same thing. They said, we've never gone to trial as much as we have in the last couple of years. So I think the, the yeah, it's the trend. Okay. Now, your job's stressful, right? Very. <laughs> okay. Tell us a little bit about what makes it stressful. Well, the, 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 the key thing is to have the document or the piece of evidence uh, at your fingertips. So during trial, I mean, one second delay is seems like eternity. So I have to be able to 
um, get my hand on a piece of a, a, a document or a piece of discovery instantaneously. So it just requires lots and lots of lists and chronos and timelines and indexes and uh, and and also just knowing the documents backward and forward. I know I usually know the case better than anyone on the team because I I feel like it's it's my it's my job to know how to quickly put my fingers on anything. And that that can be stressful because I have to second guess what they're going to need. And so I'll even they'll ask me to bring, you know, be sure you have this 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 and but I'll I'll think about the things that I think they might and I'll bring those as well and I'm, I'm usually right that there's things that they didn't even realize they were going to need that that I have readily available. Okay. Tracy, is this all done electronically? Uh, unfortunately not. I mean, I, yeah, my, my lists, a lot of them are electronic, but unfortunately it's also boxes with files. So I have everything, uh, in trial director and in, in OneNote, but I also have file folders in a, in a box next to me that I have to be able to, so I keep the file folders alphabetically indexed so that I can quickly find, uh, whatever document it is. Uh, so uh, we, we, we have to feed both electronic and paper, unfortunately, in this day and age. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about technology in a little bit. But first of all, uh, I'd like to know if the role of a litigation paralegal takes a specific personality, and what yeah. are the most important traits or abilities that you need. You, you can't be you can't be um, bashful <laughs> because you're sitting there in front of a jury. You know they're they're all staring right at you. Um, when you're putting uh, documents up on the screen, um, uh, if if the document isn't there or if, if something goes wrong, you have to be able to quickly troubleshoot. Um, so you have to be good under pressure, and you have to um, be resourceful. And that's where I think it, it takes a certain personality, and it also takes a lot of experience. Uh, the longer I've done it, the better I get at it. You know, so um, they call it the hot seat. You know, the the person running trial director and running the exhibits is called a hot seat operator, and it is. It, it You feel like, you know, everybody's watching you, and if there's any delay or any mistake made, you know, you just want to crawl under the table. <laughs> well, I can, I can imagine. I uh, have gone to trial a few times back in the day before we had trial director, and it, it just isn't, it isn't easy, and it does take experience. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you need to be organized. So why is that so important? Usually, I don't you know if you've been in, in, in these trials with lots of documents or big trials. Or uh, the last trial I did was a month long, and so it involved a lot of a lot of documents, a lot of paper, a lot of witnesses. We had, I think, 160 witnesses on our on our list. We didn't call all 160, obviously, but. So there's just so many boxes and so many documents and so many pieces of paper, and you just have to have it so organized that you, you can't be daunted by the by the number of documents and witnesses. So um, I, I don't know. I just, you know, 10,000 pages to me, if it's electronically organized and indexed and and chronologically sorted, I can... I, it, it's like it was five pages, so I don't know. I don't know how to describe it any better than that. But you just have to not be daunted by number and stay on top of it. Stay on top. Is that of it right? Always, yeah. But yeah, that's the Bates numbering. Obviously, is 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 big. If you have a Bates number, you can you can find anything. I I that's why I uh, I did a trial where. I ran trial director for, it was a criminal trial, and I ran trial director for the DA's office as well. Um, the lawyer I worked for didn't want it to look like we, we had all the uh, money and we were this, you know, the, the rich criminal defense lawyer and the poor DA, you know, just had a box full of papers that he was muddling through. And so we offered for me to run the DA's exhibits too. And so, you know, they're both just telling me, I need this in this this document and they gave me the Bates number and I could pull up anything for either side, uh, you know, instantaneously. Well, you also mentioned that you needed the ability to plan. So um, give our, 
uh, our listeners some examples of the planning you do? Well, the, the planning uh, planning ahead uh, in my article, I specific, specifically talked about the planning you need to make for logistics when you get to the courtroom. Um, if you don't have a lot of experience, then you don't know the setup of the courtroom. And in in Tulsa, the different judges have different size courtrooms. So, if you get if you get a judge that's in one of those big courtrooms and you have lots of room, and, and, and it's not a problem. But if you get a judge with a little tiny courtroom, then you you have to be able to know exactly where you're going to store your things and your boxes. And there's been times that I've had to sit in the galley because there just wasn't enough room on the council table for me and all my stuff. So I had a, I have this little portable table that I can set up anywhere, and I've had to do that. Um, you have to know where your plug-ins are. You have to know what the judge allows and doesn't allow. You have, you know, they, they're even picky about the kind of tape you use to tape down your cords. Um, you have to know when their hearings are prior to the trial so that you can get into the room because sometimes you'll show up the day before and they've got hearings all day and so you're not going to be able to get into the room. So you have to you have to plan well enough in advance that you, you can, you can uh, overcome all obstacles, and there will be many. <laughs> right. Now, Tracy, do you, uh, are most of your trials in Tulsa, or are you traveling for your job also? I don't travel much. I mean, we we uh, we sometimes do to the surrounding towns, uh, but no, I I don't I don't usually go out of state. We're we're local. Okay, we're like Oklahoma City and yeah 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 right. a few hours away. Yes, but not out of state normally. I did go. I did. I take that back. I did go to Palm Beach once. <laughs> that was fun. Nice. <laughs> I like that. That's that's one of the benefits. Unfortunately, I always say that traveling isn't as exciting as it's made out to be when you're working like that. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Exactly, right. You're tired. So right. anyway, the... Um, the ability to organize, the ability to plan are, are what are called soft skills. And those skills aren't learned in class, but they are acquired by experience. So do you have any tips for acquiring those soft skills? Well, I do rely on uh, the support staff here in the office. And um, the last trial I did, we uh, the, the, night, the night before closing, we that's the one that it was a month long trial so there were so many do- so many boxes and so many documents and we were we were tired of living in all that and all that mess and so the lawyers and I all decided let's just pack up everything tonight and you know we won't worry about then we don't have to worry about it after closing so we get to court the next day and uh we needed some documents out of some of those boxes and this was a high profile case also it was a jail death case and so the courtroom, unbeknownst to me, they locked the doors to the courtroom. And so my assistant here at the office, I had texted her, you know, run these documents to me. And she's texting me. She goes, I can't get in the courtroom. I can't. They're, it's locked. They won't let me in, you know. And I was just I was just like, you've got to find a way. And so we're, you know, texting back and forth. And and I, I think what I've, what I've done, like you said, the soft skills is, is convince the people at the staff and train the people here that not only um, not only do I never give up, you can't give up either. You know, like she had to find a way, and luckily I've I've uh, worked with her long enough that she knew that she could just say, oh, well, I couldn't get in. You know, she found a way to get the documents in to me. That's a great story. I really like that. Now, I get a lot of questions about preparing a trial notebook, but we're going to talk about that after we take a short break for a word from our sponsors, NALA, the Association of Legal Assistants, Paralegals, Boston University, and ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted pre-screened process servers. So we'll be right back with Tracy Mose. NALA means professional. NALA offers continuing education and professional development for all paralegals. A NALA certified paralegal credential has been a gold standard of professionalism for over 30 years. 
More than 15,000 paralegals have this certification, and nearly 2,000 have achieved the demanding, advanced, certified paralegal. NALA works actively with all those in the legal field to promote the value of paralegals and to advance paralegal professionalism. See more about why NALA means professional at NALA.org. That's N-A-L-A dot org. Are you looking to advance your career? Do you know someone who wants to enter the paralegal profession? Boston University's fully online Certificate in Paralegal Studies is a fantastic option. It's affordable, takes just 14 weeks to complete, and is led by accomplished faculty who teach employer-focused skills like legal research, writing, technology, and more. Visit paralegalonline.bu.edu for more information and to download a free brochure. That's paralegalonline.bu.edu. Welcome back to the Paralegal Voice. I'm Vicki Voice, and my guest today is Tracy Mose, ACP, and we're discussing the life of a litigation paralegal and the important skills a paralegal has to possess to work in this fast-paced field. Now, as I said before break, um, I do get a lot of inquiries about preparing trial notebooks. And so, Tracy, explain to our, our listeners what is a trial notebook and why is it so important? Okay, yeah, this, 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 uh, I remember the first time I had a class where an experienced paralegal taught, taught, uh, trial, trial preparation, and I, I'll never forget thinking, uh, I use that as my guide for years, you know, what to put in my trial notebook. The longer you do it, it just seems like a, a duh, you know. <laughs> of course you need these things. Yeah. Um, so you you obviously need the pretrial order. You need the originating document, the complaint or the petition. And then the, uh, the obvious things you need are the exhibit lists and the witness lists. Now that's for both sides, so not just yours. You also need to keep track of the other side's exhibits and, and uh, witness lists. And so I always have the space on my exhibit list for the number, the description, the Bates number, and then a column for was it offered in evidence because a lot of times it'll be offered, but it won't actually be admitted, and you need to know um, was it offered, you check that, and then was it objected to, you check that, and then was it admitted finally. So I have my notes, and in, in my experience, the lawyer's, start at the beginning of, at the beginning of trial keeping it, keeping notes on these things and they quickly just <laughs> fall fall short and rely on me to keep track of it because it's 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 a job in itself and then the witness list uh, you have to, you also usually know the night before who's going to be on the stand the next day so you keep that list going as well um, then um, a lot of times if the witness can't come to trial, you'll just read their deposition testimony and there's something called de- designations that are done prior to trial. So you have to keep that in your trial notebook so that you can follow along during the reading or the video of the deposition and make sure that the, they're only uh, reading or, or showing the testimony they were allowed to show pre-trial uh, by the judge. And then you have your motions in limine, uh, because a lot of times those are decided. Uh, the judge will hold them in advisement um, and make the decisions in trial. So a lot of times you don't know the outcome of your motions pre-trial. And then, of course, your jury instructions, that's a big part of it. Um, you'll have your, your, your side's proposed jury instructions and the other sides, and then the judges. There's usually three versions of the jury instructions before you go into trial, and then it eventually becomes the judge's set at the end. Um, If there's a trial brief, any briefing done before the trial, you'll need that in your binder. Um, And then the jury seating chart and questionnaires, that, that is something that I keep as we go along in trial because you'll you, you want to remember which juror is is sitting there uh, 
as the tr- as the trial goes along, we refer back to our seating chart and our notes on the jurors throughout trial, and then the index for all your boxes that has to be in your trial notebook. And it, I usually have a couple of copies of the trial notebook, one for me and at least one for the counsel table so that one of the lawyers can pick it up anytime they so choose. Okay, tell me, uh, are, do you watch the jury for your attorney? I, yes. If You if, watch their reactions? It, if, I'm, if we're not up, you know, if I'm not on trial director... Yes, when the other side is is uh, uh, examining the witness. Yes, I'm watching. I'm watching the jury making notes. The last trial we did. That is a good point. And this happened after I wrote this article. We had a Google a Google Doc um, that we used for the jury selection, and so we were all typing into this document live. So everyone at the office was inputting things about the jurors. I was, the lawyers were, we were, and it was like a moving, breathing, uh, changing document, real time. It was pretty cool. Um, yeah. It, it wasn't perfect because it was the first time we used it, but we have some fine you know, some fine tuning to do, but it was great because in the past it's just been text back and forth or emails back and forth, but this was a, a, a live document that was really, really cool. That sounds really interesting, and I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated with the uh, program Bull. Do you watch Bull at all? Yes, yes, uh, yes. I know, he's you, great. You need Bull. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yes. He, yeah. <laughs> okay, so when do you begin your trial notebook? I'm well, assuming you don't wait until you're ready to go to trial. Oh, no, 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 that's that's that month before uh, trial. That's when all that, that work starts, including the witness files. I start, I start all that at least a month before trial. I kind of go overboard on my witness files. I, I have um, uh, everything in the in a document management program, and I, I'll have every piece of paper that has that witness's name mentioned, or you know, <laughs> in in the mm-hmm. file. And you know, it's kind of it's kind of overboard. But I just feel like if I have more than I need, then. Uh, something may come up and and uh, we'll say, didn't she say, you know, blah, 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 and, and I could pull that paper up real quickly. Right. Great idea. Mm-hmm. Now, are you involved in a case from the beginning? Yes, usually. I mean, uh, now that I've been here at this firm six years, yeah, all of the cases will, especially from now forward, I'll be in it from the beginning. It's it's much harder when you get in, the, in a case in the middle. I, as a matter of fact, this jail death case, the last trial I, I did, um, that was not my case. And so I didn't know anything about it until a month before the trial started. That was hard. Very hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've given us some examples of um, things that go in a, in a trial notebook, so we're not going to go over that again. But I'd like to know how technology plays into uh, trial prep at your firm. We we like to to, to use de- demonstratives, lots of demonstratives. So we have a graphics artist that that we start um, working with uh, a few months before trial starts, and so that's when. Uh, and I liaise with the graphic artist where we have meetings, and then you know whatever documents we talk about, she might need. I, you know we we I coordinate that she gets everything she needs. Um, we. We do a lot of uh, slides or bl- uh, blow-up boards where we always try to have the picture of the witness. So if we don't have the picture of the witness, if we didn't depose that person, we don't have their picture on file, then I go out or our graphics artist goes out on the Internet to find pictures <laughs> so that uh, the the jury can say, oh, yeah, I remember that person, you know, and it, it helps tie mm-hmm. them, re- re- have them remember the witness that we're talking about. Um, so the the visual the visual aspect um, to to technology is 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 very important in a jury. Like Bull, if only we had it as fancy as he has, uh, it'd be even better. Right now, uh, what about? Uh, I know you use Trial Director. What other programs do you use? Uh, we we use Case Notebook, which is a Westlaw pro, uh, product. 
um, and that's the one that I, I have all my documents in, well, the key documents in, and so everything is organized in that in that software. And then I also use OneNote for discovery. Uh, OneNote is used more during the discovery process than trial, but it, it's very helpful during discovery. And to me, discovery the, the discovery process is as important to preparing for trial as anything. So Right, right. Do you have a, a digital trial notebook? That the 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 digital trial notebook is, is the one note. Um, I and the case notebook. So I don't have one digital 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 trial notebook. Um, I probably will start trying to figure something out like that because we love um, to use iPads during trial. Um, I have all my documents on iPads, and so if we if if my lawyer needs a document, and and the fastest way for me to get it to him is to walk up to him, hand him an iPad, you know that's that's sometimes the the best way to get him a document quickly. Um, so we have everything we've used trial pad before. Um, uh, we have things. Yeah, we have things electronically and paper always, both places. Okay. Now, your worst nightmare, you lose documents. So what do you do about uh, a backup? Yeah, it actually happened to me. It's never happened to me before. Everyone always talks about having, you know, the, the second the second laptop with them, and I never have. I've just been lucky. And uh, a few trials ago, um, my my laptop fried during trial, and luckily, I had everything, um, you know, backed up onto that uh, uh, portable hard drive, but I didn't have it with me. And so I had to text, you know, my office, and, and uh, they delivered it to me, and I, ha- I was back up and running in 15 minutes. But I'll never not have it with me <laughs> in the future. Luckily, this, right. is, this is my other tip to paralegals is, be friendly with the other person running uh, trial director for the other side because during that trial, that that girl, that woman and I were very friendly, and she just immediately she saw the panic in my face and knew something was going wrong, and she immediately offered to uh, run our our exhibits until my system was back up, and I'll be forever thankful to her. Right. So everything really happened without. Um Without a without any delay, right? Right, because she ran she ran my exhibits for me in the fifteen minutes it took for me to get mine delivered to me and back up. You know, so if right. you're all if you're all ready to go, it doesn't take long to uh, uh, get back up and running. Okay. Now, do you take any other supplies to trial? Oh yeah, we have yeah we have what we call the trial box, and it's one of the one of the women I worked with a few trials ago, she had it. It looked like a fish, fishing tackle box, and that was cool. I liked it. I, I I keep telling everyone here that we need one like that where it, you know, opened up and she was able to pull trays out, and, and it was really tall. I loved that. Yeah. Yeah, we always have the, the trial box full of the laser pointers and the extra batteries and the, your pens and pencils and, and your chargers, of course. You always have to have chargers and and snacks and mints and aspirin and Tylenol and, you know, everything you could possibly need. Yeah, especially in a month-long trial. Yes, I think that has really to be replenished. Things. Yes, yeah, that, that's constantly re- replenished as well. Okay. Now, in your article, you refer to the one-box rule, and I'd like for you to explain that, because I can't imagine with all the boxes that you need how you're talking about a one-box rule. Right. We, it's usually my box too. You know, it'll have my name on it, and um, it's the it's the box. And the and actually, the contents can change as the trial progresses. But um, as a matter of fact, I actually try to get it down to. I don't know if you guys use what we call red ropes. In, in the old days, right. it really was a, a a folder with a string around it with a red rope that you could tie around it. But now they're just open. We, but we still call them red ropes. But I, I actually like to get all of the, the the hot docs, the key docs, into one red rope, actually, even. So that's that's how 
you need the help of the lawyers to to get it that cons- that that fine tuned. But usually, it starts with my. I'll say, I think these are the key documents or the hot documents. You guys look at it and tell me if I'm right. Tell me which ones you you think I can get rid of. Uh, but uh, the key documents, yeah, usually they they really can be narrowed down to about twenty, usually. Um, but in a big trial or a long trial, uh, my box will be ch- constantly changing. Usually it'll have the witnesses that are going to be on the stand that day and my key documents always and um, de- deposition transcripts. Yeah, so it is kind of fluid as the trial progresses. Okay, so you'd be updating that every night. Yes, yes. And everybody knows it's my box, and so we always have to make sure that my box goes back to the office and my box gets back to the courthouse. Usually usually I'll have a box, and and each of the lawyers will have, you know, their hot box. And then the rest are just the the, the periphery, but we all know and try to... uh, zoom in on those key documents at all times. Okay. Well, Tracy, uh, do you have any other tips for paralegals who might want to work in litigation or who might be preparing for a trial today? I, I Yeah, I think that I think the newest thing was that Google Doc. So you all have to have a Gmail account and you sign in to, you just sign into your, your um, Gmail account and then you get invited to the document and then you, somebody has to set up a template. So uh, if you have 12 jurors, it'll have like it'll be like one big giant spreadsheet with 12, you know, columns. And um, everybody, you know, you know who's inputting. Um, but that's the quickest way to because when you're picking a jury, you uh, you have the person on the stand and you're learning. I'm learning information live, you know, that where she worked, what her husband does, where, you know, where she's from. And so I'm inputting those kind of things. And then the team in the office can find the right person. Because especially if you get a person like Mary Johnson or Mary Jones, you, you can't find that person until you get more detail. So that's the behind-the-scenes jury research that uh, is critical to select a, a good jury panel. Okay, Tracy. Um, how could they get in touch with you if they have any questions? Yeah, the, um, my email address is tmoz, T-M-O-S-Z, at brewsterlaw.com. And, um, uh, yeah, feel free to email me at, or, like you said, Facebook message me. I'm friends with lots of paralegals across the country. I also love um, LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn, I'm, I'm uh, friends with lots of uh, paralegals on LinkedIn as well. Right. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining me today. I mean, your information that you provided is just so important for paralegals, and I really appreciate your taking the time to join me, and I've, I've even learned a lot, so thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Vicki. Appreciate you as well. Thanks. Let's take another short break now, because, uh, and don't go away, because when I come back, I'm going to have a practice tip for you. We're glad you're listening to Legal Talk Network. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, too. Welcome back to the Paralegal Voice. Now is the time in the program when I have a practice tip for you. Uh, My friend Michelle Erdman sent me a... um, uh, a document that came from the Northern District of Illinois. It was in the matter of the discipline of Allison Hope Mata. Hopefully I I pronounced her name right. Uh, This order found that the attorney, Allison Mata, had uh, committed misconduct of the uh, Rules of Professional Conduct 3.5D and 8.4D by repeatedly acting in an unprofessional and disrespectful manner, including reacting to a trial judge's ruling by using profanity in the presence of the jury. 
Uh, the case that she was working on or represented was the United States versus Redwood. And this was before the Honorable Amy J. St. Eve. Now, the attorney, Ms. Mata, was uh, continually, continuously disruptive during the approximately two-week trial. Uh, some of the misconduct that occurred during the witness testimony, and I am taking this from the order, was that when Ms. Mata, visi- uh, she visibly reacted to testimony, such as by rolling her eyes, and made comments about the testimony, all in the presence of the jury. Other instances of misconduct were uh, even directed at the trial judge's rulings on objections. After unfavorable decisions on objections, she uh, would shake her head, roll her eyes, and make comments under her breath. But in one particularly egregious instance, after an objection by Ms. Mata was overruled, she rolled her eyes and said, Uh, something I won't repeat. But anyway, in those instances of disruptive conduct, uh, they occurred even after multiple warnings from the judge. So my example here is that uh, this case does apply to an attorney. There are rules of professional conduct that the attorney must follow, but these rules also apply to paralegals. And they apply Uh, exactly as they would to an attorney. A paralegal can't be disrupted during trial, can't roll her eyes, can't laugh, can't giggle, can't, uh, you know, talk under her breath in the presence of the jury. Uh, And those are all things that I have heard that attorneys might ask the paralegal to do just to sway the jury a little bit. But in all of the actions of the paralegal, uh, must be uh, the the actions that would be expected of the attorney. The same rules apply, and if a paralegal acts in this way, the attorney might be disciplined, um, uh, disciplined, and and perhaps, as in Miss Mata's case, even um, not allowed to practice in the trial court for a year. So that was a that was not a good. Um, Example to set for other attorneys, and certain. Well, I guess it was a good example because now you know that you can't do any of these small acts that would, um, re- uh, that would apply to attorneys that also would result in their uh, discipline if the if the paralegal does that. So take that to heart. Be sure that you uh, pay attention. Now, that's all the time we have today for the Paralegal Voice. If you have questions about today's show, please email them to Vicki, spelled V-I-C-K-I, at paralegalmentor.com. And also, don't forget to check out my website and my blog. You'll find that at paralegalmentor.com. The resources there have been designed to help you move your career in the right direction, and that's always forward.